our graduates from engineering law and management disciplines are welcomed in leading global companies and top universities abroad the reason we are a top university is simple at ncu all education is contemporary and focused on the future we take great pains to offer education that will be relevant today and in time to come the same intent also drives our recent collaboration with the arizona state university the leading american university our partnership is exclusively the first of its kind in india in terms of coverage breadth and depth it covers all programs across the three schools that we have engineering management and law and all all of this is designed to give you a degree that will be your asset in in your working lives dear students modern society cannot exist without a strong foundation of justice and fairness without justice there are no guarantees for your freedoms or your security just look at india's western neighbors who would want to immigrate and live there in his influential work a theory of justice john rawls tells us that the justice and fairness have a strong moral imperative and establishes the basis for procedural justice as opposed to distributive justice many speakers in this master class series have warned about how machine algorithms from big technology firms are strangling our privacy reducing us to mere manipulated objects and how unchecked their power is over all of us on the other hand the rise of fake news and manufactured narratives are threatening the fabric of our civil society as we saw during the delhi riots 2020 is jurisprudence the answer what are the remedies more importantly do these trends point to new opportunities for the legal profession our guest today wants to share her perspective on this let me introduce her honorable justice pratibha maninder singh is the justice of the delhi high court prior to her appointment as judge she has made significant contributions to academic literature and legal developments in indian intellectual property law as a practicing lawyer and as an advisor to several legislative committees concerned with drafting the related laws in 2013 she established the pratibha singh cause scholarship for the llm candidates at the university of cambridge to provide financial support to indian students studying for masters in law just as singh studied law at the national college national law college sorry bangalore karnataka and obtained llm from the university of cambridge on a cambridge commonwealth trust scholarship today she will speak to you on the topic careers in law as always you can write your questions and responses in the chat just a sing good evening and welcome to the north cap university yes uh, good evening thank you professor milind padalkar the stage is yours ma'am yes thank you very much uh, a very warm good evening to everyone and uh, thank you for having me at the north cap university uh, i specifically thank uh, senior advocate uh, akshay makija for having invited me and uh, i wasn't aware of the university and i've read about it after the after i was invited and it is indeed uh, my pleasure to uh, to be here and to meet all of you today though in a virtual manner because uh, this is the only way we've all been meeting during the pandemic and uh, while uh, this is better than not meeting at all the best meeting would be in physical campus i'm sure and um, thank you for calling me and for having me over at the university uh, i've been informed that uh, the today's uh, session is open for all the candidates all the students in the university but uh, the primary focus would be on students uh, who are pursuing their law uh, especially the first year students uh, i think uh, you know you are you've entered the uh, beginning of a law course during a pandemic and so it is very it is going to be very different for you the manner in which you are going to be studying and the manner in which the uh, courses are going to be uh, taught to you and uh, the lack of maybe um, complete campus uh, atmosphere feeling and experiences but be that as it may the first and the foremost question that may come into everyone's mind 
as you've joined law is, why did I join law? Is it worth it? So let me give you a perspective uh, as to why I think that law is absolutely essential for people from any profession. Uh, studying law is extremely uh, essential because I think that uh, as Professor Padalkar said to you in his introductory remarks, it is law and the rule of law that binds society in general. Whether, whether you're an engineer, a doctor, a chartered accountant, a sociologist, a lawyer, a teacher, any other person working in government administration, or even for example, a housemaker, a knowledge, knowledge of law is going to be a very big uh, enabler for all of you, uh, because I think that no profession can be pursued effectively without the knowledge of law. No administration would be effective without the knowledge of law. That's the reason why you will see that almost all persons in government uh, who are some of the topmost administrators have done their law and they've studied the subject of law. So whether it is for the purpose of following a career, whether it is in simply as a pastime, whether it is to, you know, as a support degree for your existing degree, a degree in law will never do you any bad. And it is going to be a very big asset in your life. And so you've made the right choice is what I can say. And uh, the study in law is going to be a very uh, interesting and also a very in-depth approach of how society itself is regulated. The confidence that a person gets in real life is increased manifold if you're a law graduate, because you know that you can never be on the wrong and you know the difference between right and wrong. So having said that, uh, let us now look at some dimensions of law and what you can do. Now that you're already in a law college and you've already enrolled in law school, what is it that you're looking for during your five years? Uh, during the five years of law, I must, I must take you all back to a state. Uh, I don't know if this law course is five years course. I guess it is. And uh, whether it's a three-year course or a five-year course, the most important thing is, as a lawyer, the study of law as a theoretical subject itself. The study of law actually takes you back to the situation or position as to what made us human beings in a society. It is law that binds human beings in a society and keeps us in a particular way in which we behave. Without law, none of us would behave the manner in which we would. Why would you take out your car and drive on the left? Because there's a law which says you must drive on the left. Why is it that people don't go around committing crimes? Because there is a law which says you will be punished if you commit crimes. Why is it that in a social setup, you behave in a particular manner? You do not, you do not abuse people. You speak decent words. You study, uh, you, you behave in a particular way. All this is because there is some law which governs you in some way. And therefore, law binds each of us in our social and cultural uh, interactions. Whether it is within family, without family, neighbors, larger part of society, in whatever manner. It is law which binds all of us and the way we behave. So what is it that you can do by studying law? The possibility of what you can do by studying law is based on several factors. It could be on your own personal interest, whether you like a particular field of law, what is the motivation with which you are studying law, some people may want to do academics. Some people may want to study law for the interest of law. Some people may want to practice in court. Some people may want to do corporate law. There could be various reasons why you are studying law. And, uh, you know, sometimes I've actually interviewed candidates during scholarship and uh, they have, you know, decided to do law because of their own personal experiences within family. For example, I remember one student telling me that uh, one of her parents, suffered a lot for not 
uh, non-availability of medicines. And therefore, she decided to pursue patent law. Another person told me that the uh, someone in the family had suffered due to medical negligence. And therefore, he or she decided to pursue law. So there may be various factors which may have motivated you to join law. Please keep that factor in mind while studying law. But please don't be bound by it. Please be flexible. Keep your mind and heart open. There may be something more that you may be wanting to achieve. And the motivational factor may have brought you into law, but it need not be the, you know, the bottom line for you to do law. While you are studying law, the motivations may change, the experiences may change, the interests may change, and it's perfectly all right to change your motivations while you studied law. Sometimes people uh, have studied law, maybe from the big national law universities or other universities with an intention to make sure, you know, that we have some kind of job security when we, because of financial conditions of the family. Others may say, no, my family is quite settled. They're willing to support me for the next two, three years, even after I do law. So I have the option of taking risk. I can do litigation. You know, I would be surprised. Uh, uh, you will be surprised to know that when we joined law, for example, in the uh, late 80s or in the early 90s, law was not the priority cause. I'm, I myself wanted to do medicine. And uh, for various personal and other reasons, I couldn't pursue medicine. And then I decided to do law. Whereas in the after the turn of the century in 2000, Law has become such a sought after course and sought after profession that I have known students who have given up seats in AFMC Pune in IITs to be able to pursue law. So today law is one of the most sought after courses in India. And uh, the reasons for that are not far to seek because, you know, when uh, India has had the economic development and liberalization of the economy, the need for legal professionals has increased a lot. There are more and more lawyers required in various fact facets of society. And therefore, uh, doing law is seen as a quite an in thing now. So if you're doing law, you'll find within your friends, family, social circles, people will reach out to you with small problems, with small issues. So you should, in the past, as part of your legal education, be able to support society in general and your own social circle and relate, rel relatives, family members in particular. So doing law is, is uh, empowering you and making you, giving you more importance within your own uh, family and social circle. So therefore, I do think that the motivation to do law could be any factor, but you've, you've chosen wisely and you've been chosen wrongly is what I can say. Now, what is it that you can do uh, during your time as a law student? The law course, whether it's three or five years, is a long period. You are taught your various subjects by your teachers in the university. Firstly, I do believe that the interaction between the faculty and the students has to be very, very active and robust. Because if you don't do that, the practical aspects of law, one can never understand. In order to understand the practical aspects of law, it is important to do case law based learning. So even if a particular section or particular provision of law or a subject has been taught to you, as you go by in your law courses, even amongst your friends, you should know what are the main judgments in a particular subject. Those judgments you should read up on your own if you have a case math system like, uh, I know DU has case math, case math system. You should try and study those judgments. And amongst yourselves, you should form small groups and discuss these judgments amongst yourselves. Because in law, there is nothing that is right or wrong. A lot of it is in the gray area. And one, one person may have a, one opinion about a judgment and another person may have a different opinion. Whether it's constitutional law, law of evidence, whether it's CPC, criminal law, any law, please read the leading judgments on that particular provision 
when the provision is taught to you in the course. It's only then that you will be able to understand the practical aspect of how the law is applied. The second thing I would say is irrespective of the subject that you're studying, you should know how to analyze the basic statute of any subject. Let us, let us say it is, the, uh, it is the probate, it's a probate case. Let's, it's the transfer of property case. Let's say it's specific performance. If you pull out the particular Bayer Act, it's important for you to understand what are the statutes behind each and every law and what is the structure of that statute. When you open the index of a statute, you will see that the statute has a particular structure. The minute you start understanding how acts are structured, half the job is done. Any new statute will not uh, be a challenge to you. You will be able to analyze the statute very nicely. Every statute, as I keep telling my law researchers and interns, is like a story. Every act is like a story. It will give you in the statement of objects and reasons, the reason why the act is being enacted. The sections will form a pattern. And when you read it in a pattern, it will give you the story. For example, if you take the Transfer of Property Act or the Specific Performance Act or the Contract Act, let's take the Contract Act, for example. What is a contract? What are the elements of a contract? What are the manners in which contract can be breached? How can a contract be enforced? What are the remedies that are available when a contract is breached? How are remedies granted? How are damages granted? That's the structure of the Contract Act. So if you open the Act itself, the Bear Act itself, section-wise, if you read it amongst yourselves or with your teachers, you will realize that there's a pro proper structure and there's a proper story in every statute. The minute you understand every statute like a story, then you will never forget it and you will never face a challenge in interpreting a statute. So the manner of studying has to be through the sections, through the structure of the statute and the leading case law on that particular statute. Now, what should I do? What should be my focus when I'm a law student? So, I can give you an example, you know, your internships, which you do during your law courses are expected to be to be uh, enablers to enable you to decide what should be your thinking and what is the area of law in which you wish to work. For example, I remember when I studied law in University Law College, Bangalore. In my third year of law, I went and did an internship with a lawyer who was working in the family courts. And in those family courts, there, was, uh, there were a large number of custody matters, maintenance matters, divorce matters, et cetera, which were being heard. And I recall very clearly that in one case, there was this uh, 10 to 12 year old boy who was in the witness box, who was being asked by the judge as to whether he wishes to you know, be with his mother or his father. And prior to him being called into the court uh, witness box, he was sitting in the last bench of the courtroom and reading a uh, Hardy Boy's uh, novel. And I felt so bad when I saw that little child that, uh, you know, and the manner in which he was questioned in the court, that I felt that, you know, I won't be able to ever do family law because I won't be able to, it may have an effect on the manner in which I may, you know, think about family in general. So that one day, it, my experience led me to decide, I don't want to practice family law. So these kind of experiences make you think about what you want to do and what you want to be in life. So use your internships to be able to get the maximum exposure to different areas of law and different, uh, you know, career options as well. Go work in a corporate law firm, work in an administrative body, work in a policy making body, an academic institution. So you will know what is it that I want to do in my life. And that will help you to decide. So these four to five years, you can use very effectively doing internships, meeting people and understanding as to what is the manner in which you want to pursue your career in law. Uh, the other 
a factor that could affect how you proceed with your legal career is your own uh, you know nature some people are very introverted some people are extroverted some people have a strength in writing some people have better speaking skills so these you will identify as you uh, interact with your peer group with your teachers with your fa family members with your colleagues etc in the college so that will make you understand as to whether i want to go to court somebody who thinks that i can draft better and i don't want to appear before a court can choose a particular path of career another person who thinks i'm good at debating i'm good at public speaking can decide that no i think i can do this i want to be a court going lawyer so your own interest you will understand it identify which will enable you to decide as to what kind of lawyer you want to be and you may want to pursue your masters or do a phd and be an academician even then you will be able to understand as to what is the subject you want to study in nowadays the practice of law has become extremely uh, you know uh, niche and it is very focused so there can be phd be courses which are for example in cyber crime separately within cyber crime there could be um, different kinds of phds that you will be able to do you can do phds in for example intermediary liability you can do phd in the law of privacy you can do phd in for example uh, within patent law specific branch of patent law so there are different uh, niche areas within niche areas which you can which you can uh, which you can uh, choose before uh, during your law course before you reach your llm or your phd stage and considering that i was just uh, speaking to uh, your professor and asking as to um, what are the other faculties that the university is offering you are offering engineering and management uh, courses so according to me the study of law also ought to be interdisciplinary because in law now there is a great requirement which i will be speaking of in a few minutes of lawyers who have basic foundation in different areas of uh, areas of expertise for example it could be physics it could be chemistry it could be biology it could be engineering it could be economics it could be business it could be marketing human resources so these people along with law are now a required breed of professionals who are really really sought after so therefore i think uh, in your university the interdisciplinary studying and interdisciplinary interaction is uh, absolutely uh, essential and important it will make you open up your vision and how those courses have a great bearing on legal aspects for example a course on accounts would be very essential for lawyers who may want to litigate or who may want to do tax practice or who may want to do gst related practice simply even for example in a case where damages have to be ascertained we need uh, people who are professionals in accounts so some of our judges are in fact chartered accountants even today in the delhi high court so therefore uh, a basic uh, understanding of accounting and its principles will go a long way in even your practice of law in a particular area of law so this kind of uh, the, the next thing for example i can give you is an electronics engineer or a mechanical engineer doing patent law these professionals are so sought after for example if you look at iit kharagpur which gives a course a four year course law course for students who finished sciences any branch of science so those are the persons who can take a patent agent exam who can draft patents who can become patent professionals who can you know create businesses which uh, which are related to patents and intellectual property so without a science background one cannot practice it is very difficult to practice uh, patent law now in india or become a patent agent which is not possible actually you need a science degree so therefore the interdisciplinary nature of law studies has become more and more important now and i think north cap university which with the uh, three departments existing i e engineering management and law 
there is a big potential for you to create interdisciplinary law degrees and law courses. And even if it's a general law course, please have different, uh, different subjects which you can offer to the students based upon their interest, wherein you can have people from your engineering department teaching law students, people from the management department teaching law students, or even vice versa, people from the law faculty teaching managers and engineers as to the areas of uh, career opportunities that they have in their lives. So I think uh, we should focus a lot on interdisciplinary teaching and you could major and minor in different subjects. This is the manner in which internationally law is taught and we should try and implement that uh, within India in to, insofar as legal education itself is uh, concerned. Now I would move on to um, what are the options uh, which law students have when they have, uh, you know, when they, when they are doing law and then what are the career choices that they have. The first and the foremost is, in my opinion, it is not sufficient to just do a simple law course. It is very, very uh, important or essential, if I may say, to do at least a master's in some subject because doing a master's always uh, gives a person a lot of maturity, especially if you're a five-year law student without a basic grounding in either of like the, any other subject. If you've chosen law directly, then it always helps to do a master's, whether in India or abroad, because it will make sure that you are able to uh, broaden your vision. You get the requisite experience. You could always choose to do your master's after working for a couple of years. This is one of the biggest questions that law students ask me. Should we do LLM first or should we do the LLM after a couple of years? There are both options which are good. Some people want to finish education straight away and then go into litigation. Though those people who wish to do litigation, they may want to do a straight away LLM. And those who wish to do non-litigation and, and uh, you know, uh, practice in other, uh, do your law in other areas of uh, vocations and, uh, you know, like academics, etc. You could do an LLM even later, teach for a couple of years and then, and then do an LLM in a course which you like. But either way, I do think that getting a second degree in law is always useful, though there is, it's not always essential. A large number of lawyers practice immediately after their LLB and they are very, very successful. So it depends on your personal situation, financial situation. If you have the option of doing an LLM, you, you try and do it. And uh, what are the kind of career options that you have? Uh, when we graduated from law, we only knew two or three things, at least in my generation. For example, when I finished in my fifth year of law, I was interviewed by Hindustan Lever as a management trainee in their legal department. And I got into their company as a legal, as a legal manager. But when I told them that I want to pursue my LLM in Cambridge because I got admission there, they said, okay, we'll wait for you. And so they waited till I, they held my position. I was able to join them for a couple of days, but then I got the option of moving to Delhi and practicing in intellectual property, which is what I chose. So at that time, there were very few options available. Basically, we could go into government jobs or for example, uh, take exams like the IAS or other civil service exams, revenue services, et cetera. Or we could do corporate law or litigation or we could join a company as a legal manager or academics. These were very five or six, uh, you know, main uh, options that were available. But I do think that now the uh, options and career uh, uh, progression uh, charts for lawyers has increased uh, a lot. And there are varied uh, kind of careers which you can look at, uh, apart from corporate and litigation uh, and academics, etc. You can, uh, of course, join judicial services. Immediately after passing law, there is the entry-level judicial service exam which you can give, for which you can also study. And uh, across the country, you know, there are uh, services which are, uh, the states announce these judicial service exams. So, you know, during your law studies, if you belong to a particular native place, it makes uh, a lot of sense to learn a regional language, to learn reading and writing of a regional language, because in some of the judicial service examinations, the knowledge of the local language is uh, essential because a large number of documents in those states would be in the local language. For example, in Karnataka, it's in Kannada. 
in up in hindi in maharashtra it could be, it could be marathi gujarati so whichever part of the country you are from or you want to apply for a judicial service you can increase your knowledge by mastering that particular regional language if you are interested in joining for example an international institution like any uh, un related body or any other international organization within india also it would be very helpful if you could learn a foreign language so those institutions require you to learn uh, along with english on the knowledge of english you you can know either french spanish uh, german any other there are certain uh, uh, subjects you can uh, you can learn so learning an international language or a local regional language uh, would be a very big uh, asset which you will have if you study law and uh, start uh, studying it uh, simultaneously it will really help you and uh, this is something which uh, most people are not aware so i thought i must tell you about this so judicial services is one option legal journalism is another option which uh, a large number of lawyers uh, are getting uh, employment in uh, legal uh, in journalistic uh, you know websites newspapers magazines almost uh, all the uh, publishing industry etc is looking for professionals who have journalistic capabilities so you could also you know simultaneously pursue your writing skills and other kind of courses which could help you writing in general and one very important thing that i would say as a lawyer is reading of newspapers it is absolutely essential the younger generation reads only online news um even my children read online news i keep telling them that it's important to read a newspaper please the old system of uh, reading newspapers in the morning while you have breakfast is an excellent uh, uh, you know habit which you should inculcate as law students because a large number of uh, articles and uh, editorials etc which come in the newspaper and do not appear in online platforms and in any event since you are, you have to get used to the uh, manner in which you read quickly and interpret and understand and imbibe it's always good to read from the print medium and uh, you know lawyers some of the senior advocates who might briefed you'll be surprised if uh, for example as a briefing counsel i gave a judgment to a senior counsel they would literally their eyes would be like scanners we have to be like scanners you should be able to know which are the key words to pick up in a particular page you should be able to understand quick reading is part of uh, a lawyer's very big asset so you should be able to uh, you know uh, read quickly so please inculcate the habit of reading and not merely from electronic platforms but from print medium it is very important read magazines read newspapers spending that half an hour or one hour in the morning reading the newspaper along with your tea and coffee or with your breakfast will go a long way in making sure that you turn out to be a good legal professional another thing i have understood uh, is uh, is that uh, the when you when you're a lawyer and suppose uh, you have a particular client whom you are rendering your service to in general to read about those companies or their businesses for example in an economic times or a business standard newspaper or any other business newspaper he is absolutely essential because when you are when you are representing a client to know the difficulties or the problems or the good things that are happening with that particular client makes you a more effective lawyer when you are appearing in court or when you are having a meeting with the client because suppose it's a suit for recovery i'm just saying something very 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 fundamental to you suppose it's a suit for recovery where you filed a suit for 1 crore rupees for your client and you know that there is an insolvency petition pending against your client you just read in the newspaper the client may not have told you they are they are going through difficulties and you read in the newspaper that an insolvency petition has been filed against that client when you represent that case in the court you will be able to say see it is because of these customers who are not paying us that we have been put into insolvency right or when the client comes to meet you you will be able to say okay hope you are able to you know uh, get over your insolvency problems your liquidity liquidity problems so the client then feels that 
you do care about them and care about their interest. The focus should not be simply on that particular case which you're doing. So these are very, very small uh, lifestyle changes which you need to make in terms of reading the newspaper, in terms of having your general knowledge, increasing your general awareness. And that's that will be very, very important in your practice of law. So legal journalism is a very important course, I mean, very important career option. Then there are, you can all be, you can also apply to be law researchers in district courts, with judges, in the high courts, etc. So that is one career option, which none of us had when we were young. You could be, if you're an engineering or a science student, you could become a patent agent. You could, you can give the patent agent exam and get employment in a law firm or a company which drafts patents. You could set up your own startup if you're a software engineer. You could do, uh, you could develop software, for example, relating to searches, relating to data analytics of uh, legal cases, uh, policy policy bodies like Vidhi, etc., who have all come up recently. They're all doing extremely well. They publish very good reports. So. Then, of course, you have the government jobs, the administrative uh, services, etc., etc. You can do either, you know, constitutional law, criminal law, IP law, family law, environmental law, cyber law, international law, etc. Any of these subjects you can specialize in, tax law, company law, uh, NCLT, because nowadays uh, you can also, if you're an accountant person, you can do, uh, you can become a resolution professional in the NCLT, you can help companies which are undergoing insolvency and, uh, you know, uh, liquidation uh, processes. You can also try and do, for example, uh, policy analysis. You can try and work in the Army, Navy, Air Force. They have judge advocate generals there. You can be an in-house legal counsel in a company. You can facilitate uh, various uh, uh, bodies such as uh, there are several uh, international and Indian business organizations, for example, FIKI, CII, NBA, National News Broadcasters Association, Indian Broadcasting Federation, etc. These are all industry bodies which require lawyers. There are various tribunals which employ lawyers as assistants. So the career options are never ending, according to me, for lawyers nowadays. And uh, you can uh, uh, also build, for example, software programmers can build AI tools, uh, which could be used for doing very simple cases such as bails, negotiable instruments, etc. So there is a lot of career opportunities now in law. And uh, you will be surprised when you go out of being a lawyer, you should be very aware of where all you can go. And you can focus your internships accordingly. You know, I remember there are students who have come up to me while they start, start their legal course. And they say, okay, we want to make a proper chart, ma'am. First year, we do these three internships. Second year, these three internships. They make a proper chart and they focus on how we are going to ensure that we get the maximum exposure during our law studies so that we can decide on what to do when we finish our law. So I think uh, this is the kind of uh, talk I wanted to have with you as lawyers, because uh, as law students, because a lot of uh, Girls, I mean, I would like to specifically speak to girls, for example, uh, for a couple of minutes. You know, law was not considered as a very uh, good career for uh, girls to pursue. But I must tell you that in the last four, four and a half years that I've been as judge, uh, for, for a couple of years, I was also in the committee dealing with the judicial service and the higher judicial service examinations. You will be surprised that uh, more than 60-70% of toppers in most law colleges are girls. And in the judicial service itself in Delhi, 55-60% to 60 at the entry-level judiciary is now being taken away by girls. So girls are having a field day in law as of today. Though there are so many articles which keep uh, coming up saying, uh, you know, in the higher judiciary, the numbers can increase. I do think that it is organically increasing. In the next 10 to 20 years, we will see more women, uh, hopefully in the higher judiciary as well. But uh, there is one thing that I want to say for lawyers and for law pursuing girls. 
there is still kind of a social uh, taboo for girls who litigate in courts. Uh, I know of juniors of mine who've actually uh, given up law because their parents feel that they may not find a proper match uh, when they want to get married. So slowly, I think that the that position is changing. Even if girls choose to be housemakers and do not want to practice law, I can tell you that a girl who studied law is much more aware of how to deal with problems in life. And she will be a much bigger support in the family as a whole than, you know, other than a non-lawyer, for example. I'm not saying non-lawyers are not good, but I'm just saying studying law should not be seen as a disadvantage for girls. There are a large number of litigating lawyers who have now become uh, women senior advocates, women Supreme Court judges, women High Court judges. So law is no longer a taboo for women. So I would encourage women to also do law because there are lots of career options for you as well. And don't think you've chosen a wrong career uh, if you're doing law. I think uh, with this, I would say that uh, I would like to wish all the students the very best in their study of law. And uh, I think we are, we are, we can take about 15 minutes of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Singh, for an eye-opening session, actually. The, uh, listening to you, uh, we all got a feeling that uh, this is a sunrise field and is, the sun is going to rise for quite, quite some time. That's as, true. Actually. As the society uh, continues to grow. Yes. So is, uh, uh, let me begin by asking one question before we turn it to the audience, because I see there are a number of questions coming from audience. Is litigation still the queen of uh, legal profession or is it much more secular now? Uh, litigation still the, what it is, uh, sorry? The queen, the queen of profession in the sense, is, is it still the most attractive part of legal profession or? Uh, uh, you know, I would say that uh, litigation is to law what surgery is to medicine. Okay. Because uh, litigation does have a lot of glamour. Litigation does have your adrenaline flowing when you get into a court and come out with an order, when you've argued well in front of a full court. I mean, we are missing those experiences now during the virtual courts. But uh, I must say that uh, litigation gives a lot of satisfaction for lawyers. And uh, I wouldn't say that others are not equally satisfying. But yes, litigation is uh, one of the biggest uh, career options for lawyers. And uh, at the end of the day, it's the courts which dispense justice, you know, and therefore I do think that uh, law in courts is very different from law outside courts. Sure. Let's take some questions from our students. Uh, Shadab wants to know, he's a student pursuing engineering, hmm. doesn't know much about law, but uh, how, how can he make sure that he's aware of law so that he doesn't get bullied on social media or things like that? Okay. Uh, so, as I said, uh, a little bit of interdisciplinary teaching will really help even at universities like yours. So, doing one or two sessions on cybercrime, doing a couple of sessions on what are the career options for engineers in law, those will really help for engineers because normally the traditional engineering career options, everyone is aware of those. But they are not aware of the fact that, you know, if you do an engineering course with a law course, simultaneously write a patent agent exam, you could actually have a very big career option of drafting of patents, being a patent litigator in the high court, being a patent drafter, patent prosecutor. You could be a patent expert who can be called as, called as a witness in a court. So this, uh, this entire regime is changing for engineers. They have a lot of career options in law. So you could maybe have a couple of sessions on cybercrime, you could have a couple of sessions on patent law and IP law in general for engineers. It will really help. And there are certain courses like the IIT Kharagpur course, which is meant especially for engineers who want to do law. So I think there should be more uh, more awareness of these courses so that uh, they, are, they have the full, uh, what do you say, the a la carte menu in front of them to be able to decide what is the meal they want, they want to have. And I might add that at NCU, we do have a system of open electives, okay. which actually leaves the choice of courses uh, in the hands of students. And the students can take uh, courses across the schools 
okay this is very good i'm very okay. glad i'm very glad like exam like i think uh, a law student doing an accounts course is very useful because the maximum practice nowadays if you see is in the nclt and in the uh, under the in, uh, insolvency bankruptcy court tax laws gst laws and uh, for that you need a grounding in accounts it will really really help and in your management courses if you have an accounting course i think there should be a cross disciplinary oh, yes. course which you can do we, we do have we do have uh, fair, fairly involved accounting courses yes there's a question from shrikant after a five year law and uh, to your point uh, during the lecture uh, i do want to mention that our degrees are indeed five year law degrees okay bba llb okay so uh, he wants to know uh, what is it a better option to go for judiciary services or civil services i have a bias over here <laughs> see civil service you are connected to the citizens and you can render a lot of service on the ground as i would say like as a district collector or as a you know in the administrative part of the government but in the judicial service uh, the the civil servants are actually answerable to the judiciary so that gives you the answer and uh, that is even, in the, even in the judicial service you can be like a magistrate at the at the level of the districts and uh, in the district court etc so i do think that it depends on what is your own uh, inclination both are extremely good options and after doing law the law subjects in the civil services exams are uh, are a very uh, good option to uh, write an exam on and uh, you can you can study easily if you've done law it's easier for you to pass either of these exams actually nikki wants to know uh, whether the covid pandemic has complicated the career options for young lawyers stepping into the workforce it has i think in litigation it has really uh, changed uh, a little bit because uh, even uh, you know lawyers with 4 to 5 years of experience are finding it difficult to uh, get new clients because old matters are not being taken up in most courts but i think this is a transition phase this is just an temporary phase slowly the courts are opening up at least you won't need to be worried because you are still in law so you will be studying so i do, i think the pandemic will be long over before you get to it's okay dave's question i think you did touch upon that during your talk uh what is saying is when should we start preparing for judiciary what are the tips and aspects that we need to remind you will uh, you will need to have a focus uh, if you want to do at least from your third year i would say if you are a five year law student minimum from your third year you should start looking at the subjects because i i do believe that in the five year course from the third year all the core subjects are taught isn't it in law so i think uh, you should start taking it seriously from your third year vishakha as a educator wants to know uh, how can we best inculcate entrepreneurial skills in the law students see lawyers are fundamentally entrepreneurs because when we open our litigation offices small chambers we are doing our own business in a way but the entrepreneurial skills in lawyers is increasing with time for example uh, i am aware of startups which have now been set up in the area of law they collect data from the national judicial data grid publish reports they do work on the policy side they give uh, assistance to lawyers on technical aspects such as engineering chemistry uh, they create software for example for notarization for attestation of affidavits they create templates for drafting plaints making software so entrepreneurial skills in law is uh, very very uh, uh, very very upcoming and you know there is a there is a effort within the court system also to have managers managers appointed in various courts to manage and administer courts because judges have do their judicial function and there is a there are several courts in the country including high courts where we have professional managers appointed to administer the courts so there is a there is a lot of scope in managerial plus law related courses as well another question from gaurangi kaushik is uh, if we do well in our internships 
and uh, do well in certain legal subjects. Does that point to a proficiency in that field? Should we basically what she is asking is, uh, should we choose a field of work where we have scored better? Uh, in terms of marks itself, I would not do that. But yes, on the basis of experience and internships, what you learn sometimes you when you go to a court, some students have come and told me. Ma'am, uh, there's a lot of time which is wasted. I don't want to waste waiting for matters. But some students feel while waiting, we are learning. So we are very happy being in courts. Or while waiting in the court lobby, we got a new client. So we are happy waiting in courts. So everything depends on what is your own experience and expertise and your inclination. You can base your decision on the basis of your experience during internships and your inclination to a subject. For example, uh, I mean, I, when I studied law, I wasn't inclined towards criminal law. Though as a judge, I have to deal with criminal cases. I didn't want to practice criminal law. But that doesn't make, some people are happy to do criminal law. Some people are happy to do family law. So it depends on your inclination and your own uh, liking as to what you are. Vidarth is curious, uh, what made you switch from, from being a lawyer to a judge? <laughs> uh, see, a uh, high court judgeship is something which is offered to very few people, number one. Number two, though I had a successful law practice, uh, it was more than 25 years since I had practiced. And uh, I felt that uh, it's time to give back to society. And I also wanted to increase my own learning curve because I did do corporate, commercial, IPR practice when I was a lawyer. And I wanted to increase my learning in different subjects and dispense justice. And that's the reason I chose to be a judge. Shiksha wants to know, I think you touched upon that during the talk, but maybe a repetition may not hurt. She wants to know what are the reasons for lack of uh, women judges in judiciary at all levels? Yes, I just told you, Shiksha, that, uh, that that impression is wrong at the civil court level, I mean, at the entry level, and at the district judge level, uh, the numbers are very, very high as of today. And it's just a question of the next five, 10 years, you'll see many women come up in the higher and, the, and even till the Supreme Court. That is what I feel. Because when you see the entry level, it's almost 60% is women. You know? So I think uh, it is. And it's what is good about, is about the fact that it's happening on merit. And it's not happening due to any positive reservation or something like that. So it's happening organically. That means we have been able to enable education of girls. We've been able to, as a society and as a country, uh, empower girls to do law and then to come into you know judicial service, which I think is the most satisfying thing when I see uh, as a judge. You know, it is so beautiful to see so many young girls coming into the judiciary. Arushi has an interesting question. She asks. It is often argued that the difference between interpretation and construction is now only limited to the academic realm. Do you think that is true? Or do the judges see a real and fundamental distinction between the art of interpretation and construction? Uh, see, I think uh, on a daily basis, when you look at various orders which are passed by courts, there is interpretation may not be required because Law is very well settled in most of the areas. However, it is not very rarely, I mean, it, well, quite often, we do have cases where interpretation is required. So to answer your question, that may not be true. Uh, interpretation of law is required at every level, despite us having developed such a rich jurisprudence over the last 75 years. Even to today, there are several issues where you know, which are not yet, un which is uncharted territory. So there is interpretation happening every day. I don't think that that's true. Dr. Pallavi has a question. Uh, besides case studies and case law, what can bridge the gap between the classroom and a courtroom? Being with a lawyer, sitting with a lawyer when he or she is meeting a client, dealing with your own family and friends, you know, when everyone comes to know you're doing law, They'll come and say, Ek will banana, kaise banana? please help me, you know. To 
look at a book, learn how to write it, learn how to draft it. Even if you take one month, two months to draft one will, it is worth it. So when people come up to you with, you know, suppose your aunt may come and say, Maine fridge kharida last month, lekin kharab ho gaya. Ab main kya karu? You know, take those things as a challenge and help people out. Then you will realize that you'll yourself learn various aspects of law. You can tell her, okay, you can file a consumer complaint. But yes, usse pehle, why don't you give a notice? So make a notice for her. Write an email to the company. Go on the website of the company and check their legal manager's email address. Write him an email. He or she may say, okay, uh, we are sorry that this has happened. We will replace the part for you. And then you say, okay, we replace the part, but then it's still not working. Then they may say, okay, we'll replace the fridge. If not, then you'll have to file a consumer complaint. Right? So that will make you read the Consumer Protection Act. That will make you understand whether you need to go to the district consumer commission, state consumer commission, which forum should you go. So these small queries that come up within your own social circle is a process of learning for you. I think we still have a couple of minutes. So I'll uh, conclude with maybe one or two questions more. Muskan wants to know, if there is any specific set of skills, one or two, which are important for choosing judiciary as a career option? If you have patience, that is the first thing that you need as a judicial, as a court. You should be able to listen to what the lawyers are saying. Most of the, a lot of times, they may or may not be making any sense, but you have to still listen because the way of presentation of lawyers is very different. At the high court level, it's very different. But at district court level, you should be able to, uh, you know, have a lot of patience. You should have a lot of compassion and empathy to the litigant. If the lawyer makes a mistake, don't make the litigant suffer. You should go beyond the lawyer and behind the lawyer. Give an opportunity. And thirdly, you should be able to understand how do I make dispense justice in this case? So that the litigant is not stuck forever in appeals after appeals. Normally in a partition suit, for example, let me say, a suit is filed, two brothers, the father passed away recently, there is one property. One brother living in Delhi, one brother living in, let me say, Bhopa. Okay, a partition suit is filed. Instead of taking the whole thing to its logical conclusion after two or three years, when the notice is issued, you say, Tell the brother, other brother, to join the proceedings. He may be an elder brother. He may say, look, I'm living in Bhopal. I may not want to live here permanently. There could be some kind of a settlement that can happen initially itself. So there should be very, you should be a very practical person. Don't be a theoretical person. Be practical, be compassionate, be empathetic, and look at the litigant behind every lawyer and every case. I think if you if you have these qualities, you can become a good judge. I think don't forget the human being behind everything. Correct. It's probably best sums it all. Yes. Uh, Justice uh, Singh, thank you very much for a very, very enlightening session. Uh, uh, I, I'm tempted to go and learn law myself now. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as your uh, prescription for being multidisciplinary. But I think... At the end, coming at the end of a very busy day for you, you spent uh, a full hour with us, took all the questions and made it so lively. All credit to you, ma'am. Thank and you. On behalf of the university, all of, uh, on behalf of all of us, let me thank you wholeheartedly. And let me hope that uh, when, the, when the COVID pandemic is over, we're able to receive you in person and have you speak to our students in person. Thank you so much, Professor. And you've been such a great moderator and, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's given such a personal touch to the whole uh, event today. Thank you very much and uh, all the very best to all the students. Thank you. Thank you.